الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وكيف تكفرون وأنتم تتلى عليكم آيات الله وفيكم رسوله ومن يعتصم بالله فقد هدي إلى صراط مستقيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون رب الشحل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر أمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد I'd like to start by saying wow <laughs> this is crazy These, uh, you know I was trying to walk here because the, the line was just insane I don't know what you people are doing go home and go to sleep but uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm honestly really shocked at this point and I'm very happy to see all of you alhamdulillah and I'm really really glad to be here I'll be very honest with you I'm extremely reluctant to come and that was because I don't like traveling in Ramadan at all but uh, inshallah ta'ala Allah rewards all of us for uh, you know for all of you that uh, I don't know how you parked your cars and you know for making the time this evening inshallah and and uh, count all of the the effort that you've made not for my sake of course but for the sake of inshallah getting closer to Allah's book and we, we, we should keep our intentions clear all the time for these kinds of things you know um, Allah makes different people means and we appreciate that but at the same time the, we're not the intention the intention is in the end to serve Allah's deen and Allah gives honor to people just like He takes it away so these are things that they, they come and they go you know so the title of this, uh, this evening is supposed to be the message of the Quran and you guys mind if I stand? I'd rather not sit down but I have to hold like 8 devices look how much of how wired I am you see when this video gets out, they're gonna see, see, I told you they got they're strapped. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, what I want to talk to you about, guys, uh, first of all, is essentially the disconnect that the Muslim Ummah, generally speaking, and we're no exception in the United States, that we're facing the disconnect between ourselves and the Quran, practically speaking. Practically speaking. And then secondly, inshallah, instead of talking about the greatness of the Quran, or talking about the, the message of the Qur'an I actually want to allow the Qur'an to speak for itself so I'm going to go, to go through a couple of ayat or I'll try actually and go as, through as many ayat as I possibly can to try to connect you to at least some portion of the Qur'an this evening and remind myself through it also and as I do this perhaps those of you that have stumbled upon a YouTube video or two might hear things that you're familiar with that I've said before that others have said before and so I want to start with this disclaimer the Messenger والسلام, when he would uh, deliver his message Allah told him for example in Surah Yunus especially in Surah Hud, the, the 11th Surah especially in places like Surah Al-Shu'ara, the 26th Surah Allah told him about the stories of previous Prophets and when he told him the stories of previous Prophets he would tell him what those Prophets used to say to their people Right? Those prophets were also talking to people that refused to believe them. So he would re Allah recorded conversations that happened between Shu'aib and his people, alayhi salam. Between Salih and his people, alayhi salam. Between Lut and his people. Between Nuh and his people. Between all these messengers and their people. For example, in Surah Hud, and two, two good examples in the Quran of that are Surah Hud and Surah Ash-Shu'ara. Okay, the, the 11th Surah and the 26th Surah. And you'll find something really interesting. Allah repeats Himself. Allah tells us, Nuh said the following. And then He gets to Salih, and guess what you find? Salih said exactly what Nuh has already said. Then He gets to Hud, and He gets to Shu'aib, and He starts telling us what they said, and guess what? They said exactly what Nuh and Salih have already said. Are they all, basically they all gave the same speech. They all gave the same speech. And I'm starting from that point. Because a lot of times you walk into the masjid for the khutbah, right? And the khatib starts, and you hear the first two minutes, you go, I heard this one before, man. <laughs> it's the same old speech. I already got this. The messenger, alayhi salatu would go and deliver a message, 
He would go and deliver a message. And of course the Qur'an, not all of it was revealed at once. And a lot of the Qur'an, especially two-thirds of the Qur'an, that's Makkah Qur'an, the first 12-13 years of the Prophet's life, alayhi salatu wasalam. You know, there's a lot of repetition in it. There's a lot of repetition in it. You know, فَأَكْثَرْتَ جِدَالُكَ أَوْ جِدَالَكَ even the people of previous prophets told them, you argued with us and you keep arguing the same thing over and over again. We've heard it before. We've heard it before. And then, you know when somebody tells you, I've already heard this, no thanks. Right? It hurts your feelings. But you know what Allah told His Messenger? فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَاتِ الْذِكْرَى فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ مَا أَنْتَ You keep on reminding, you keep on saying the same thing. Don't you worry about impressing anybody. You just say what you have to say. You, say, you tell people what they need to hear. Your job is just to get a reminder across. And so this is my advice to those of you in the audience that are activists, that do, maybe you teach at a Sunday school, maybe you do khutbahs at your masjid, maybe you're an alim, maybe you're an imam, maybe you're an activist with you know, YM or something, or another youth group, or an MSA or something, and you have to present something to some people. And you say, man, I can't give the same message over and over, or I gotta come up with something really new and fresh to impress people, to get their attention, etc. If that's your mindset, you're already, you've already got a bigger problem. You've already got a problem. We have to deliver a message of sincerity. You know the Arabs have a saying, مَا يَخْرُجُ مِنَ الْقَلْبِ يَصِلْ إِلَى الْقُلُوبِ What comes out of the heart goes inside other hearts. All you and I have to worry about is to say something genuine. We just have to be sincere. We have to understand what Allah wants us to deliver and then deliver it. Now, and this is still not my speech. These are just kind of disclaimers in the beginning. Here's another disclaimer in the beginning. And that is that, you know, I'll give you the real, the real life example, then I'll tell you what happened with the Prophet ﷺ. You know, in real life example, sometimes, for example, your, your teacher says, why don't you go talk, give this, like, give this speech, and this is what I want you to do. Make this point, then this point, then this point, meaning you get coached in what speech you should give. It's not your own speech, somebody else told you to give that speech. So it's not your own words, it's somebody else's words, right? And you go give that speech and you totally bomb it. I don't mean the literal bomb. <laughs> Those of you that are in the van outside with the recording devices, then this is just, you did a really bad speech, is what that means. Okay, so, <laughs> so you mess up the speech, or people booed it, or did, didn't like it. Your teacher had told you, try this, it's gonna work. It's gonna produce results. And you go and try it, and it doesn't produce results. Right? The next time around, same crowd. Would you do the same speech again? No, because it didn't work the first time. You didn't see good results, yes? License plate? No? Okay. Okay, I don't know why they always pick on the sisters, but yes, sisters, if you can, there are people outside, they're very sad. They're extremely sad outside. And so if you can do me the favor of scooting over a couple of feet, and that could make brothers much, much happier. So, you could do that. Oh my God! What are we gonna do? <laughs> We're gonna do the best we can. You can go back to the side. Yeah, go make uh, sisters make as much space as you possibly can. Brothers also move up as much as you can. There's a lot of people outside. Okay, I'm gonna start again. You guys can keep talking. I'll keep talking too. Okay. So the messenger, alayhi salatu was salam, was instructed to go to give what the ayat revealed to the Prophet. It's like a speech that Allah wants him to give. You can think of the Quran when it comes to the Prophet as a speech. And he has to go and give that speech. So in Surah Hud, for example, he had to give this speech to an audience. And when they heard his speech, they started making fun of him. They started booing him. They started insulting him. Who told him to give that speech? Allah did. Who wrote the speech? Allah did. The messenger's job was only to go and give the speech. But it didn't work out that well. But the next day, he has to go back and give the speech again, doesn't he? So Allah says to the messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, فَلَعَلَّكَ تَارِكُمْ بَعْضَ مَا يُحَيْلَيْكَ 
Are you going to leave some of the things that I've sent to you? Are you going to abandon some of the things that I've revealed to you? Just because you're not, because of them? Don't do it. When you read the translation of the ayah, will you abandon some of what we have revealed to you? You'd say, why would the messenger ever do that? Why would the messenger ever abandon any part of the Qur'an? Because we're thinking Qur'an is a book. For the messenger, Qur'an is not a book. What is it? It's a speech. And when you speak to people and you get a bad reaction, you say, maybe I shouldn't say this the next time. I should try something else. I should try to come up with something else. And Allah lets the messenger know, you don't have to care what reaction you get from people. The word of Allah is enough. The word of Allah is perfect. It doesn't need improvement. They're not booing you and they're not criticizing you because there's something wrong with the speech. The only thing that proves is that there's something wrong with them. The second thing that would happen is the Prophet would think there's nothing wrong with the speech. Maybe I could have done a better job delivering it. <coughs> Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I'm not doing my job well enough. So Allah would do this over and over in the Qur'an. That He would let the Messenger know you're doing your job. They've got the problem. They've got the problem. They've got the problem. Now the Messenger وسلم, has an advantage that you and I don't have. The Messenger is worried whether or not his, is he doing a good job or not. And who tells him that he's doing a good job? Allah does. When you and I are trying to do da'wah, and we worry maybe we're not doing a good job. Does Allah give us a guaranteed answer we're doing a good job? No, so we have to continue to be worried. We have to stay worried. And we have to try to keep improving ourselves. And try to be more and more and more sincere and genuine in the advice that we deliver. The last thing I want to share with you, before, and this is again the introduction, the last part of my introduction, is that when we read the Qur'an or when we try to understand the Qur'an, there are some things I want you to deconstruct in your mind. Deprogram, get them out of your system. The first of those things is, this is a book for knowledgeable people. This is a book for people that have a lot of knowledge, that are very well versed in religion, that are scholars or imams or speakers or khatibs or you name it. That's, that's who this book is for. I want you to get out to, to let this out of your mind that when you read the Qur'an you're thinking, this book, <coughs> this book is a very academic kind of exercise. Oh, it's a religious, spiritual text. I don't even want you to think about it like that first. You know what I want you to think about it like? You know when you have a real problem? A lot of us have problems. We have family problems. We have marriage problems. We have problems with our in-laws. But you say that's normal, right? So that's the problem with our in-laws. Some of you have problems with your kids. Some kids have problems with their parents. Friends have problems with each other. Some of you have problems at work. Some of you have problems in business. We have all kinds of problems. And when people have really bad problems, you know what they do? They go talk to a friend. Why can I talk to you? This thing is really bothering me. And you call a friend and you're on the phone with them for an hour, talking about your problem. Right? This is what most of us do. And hopefully people you talk to about your problems are in your family. But for most of us the problem is the family, so you gotta find somebody else. <laughs> right? So... Right? So... And, and, and this gave birth to really a gigantic scam industry, even though there are some very legitimate psychologists out there, but a lot of therapists are just crooks. They'll call you over, charge you $350 an hour and say, tell me how you feel. <laughs> tell me about your problems. And you'll talk about your problems for an hour, and at the end of that they'll say, do you feel better? <laughs> I'll say, no, you're supposed to tell me something. i like, no, no. My way of getting you to feel better is to talk about your problems. But you know, when we talk to Allah about our problems, then He gives us counsel. He gives us therapy. He gives us advice. That's what the Qur'an is supposed to be. When you're having problems, when you're having, you have, and all of us do have problems, the Qur'an is supposed to be Allah giving you and me very relevant advice for my life and your life. It's a personal relationship. It's not an academic relationship. It's not a superficial kind of relationship. First and foremost, it's a personal relationship. And when Allah is giving instructions, even when He's telling stories of the past, even when He's telling stories of the past, you're supposed to not be thinking only about the past. What should you be thinking about? Yourself. <coughs> I'll give you one example of that and I'll go on. I'll give you a scary example of that. Not only should the Muslim be thinking about himself, when he's listening to the Qur'an, the Qur'an says or teaches us that even the kafir, 
The one who hates the message of the Qur'an, the one who disbelieves in the message of the Qur'an, when they listen to the Qur'an, even they shouldn't be thinking about the past, they should be thinking about themselves. How, where did I get this from? I told you two surahs mentioned a lot of stories of previous prophets. Which two surahs did I highlight today? <laughs> Hud and Shara, right? Hud 11 and 26. And Surah Hud once again. Very interesting phenomenon. I was actually sharing this with some brothers this morning. <coughs> and later this evening at Iftar. Allah dis- decided to destroy the nation of Lut. You know that? Allah decided to destroy the nation of Lut. You know how He decided to destroy them? فَإِذَا جَاءَ أَمْرُنَا جَعَلْنَا عَالِيَهَا سَافِلَا When our decision came, we decided to make their high points their low points. You know what that means? Their buildings were very high. And Allah said some kind of earthquake, tornado, hurricane, whatever He sent, but those buildings started caving in, the roofs, the ceilings started collapsing, and the buildings are falling apart because of these earthquakes that are coming on this nation. You know what happens when earthquakes happen, right? What are you supposed to do in an earthquake? You're supposed to get out of the building. Especially if it's a minor earthquake, stand underneath the doorways, right? Stand underneath the, the, the strong construction. But if it's a major earthquake, get out of the building, be outside. Allah says everything that was high was made low. Not a tree is standing, not a roof is standing, everything's destroyed. When everything's destroyed, many people get crushed. But the people who didn't get crushed, where are they now? They're outdoors. There's no roof left. This was phase one of the punishment. فَأَمْطَرْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ هِجَارَةً مِنَ السَّلَامِ هِجَارَةً مِنْ سِجِّيرٍ مَنْبُودٍ He says, we, then we started raining on them. Now you have no roof left, you have no tree left, you have no shade left. So when it's raining, do you have anywhere to go? No. What kind of rain was this? A rain made of stones. And then he adds the word manbood. Which means, and I, I think you guys in Houston can appreciate this, you ever heard of this thing called flash floods? Right? The rain comes like a slap, like kush. And you say, okay, it's done. And then two seconds later, another slap, like gush. Like it falls like a bucket falls in one shot, instead of light drizzles. Allah says the, the, the stones would come from the sky, one big smack. And you would think it's done. Then another layer, then another layer. Then another layer. You know, I was giving the younger guys examples because they play a lot of modern warfare or whatever else. It's like... It's like that. You know, reload and then again. Reload and then again. Reload and then again. It kept on coming like that. And then the next ayah tells us something even more scary. It says, Musawwamatan. Musawwamatan. Every single pebble had been branded. Like it had the criminal's name on it. You know how in sniper fire you target very specifically? Every single bullet that sent from Allah sent from the sky was told, this is who you're gonna hit, this is where you're gonna hit him. Exact targeting. First Allah brought the targets out of the houses. Because if they were still inside the house, you can't hit them. So first Allah shook the houses and got them out of the way. Now they're outdoors, now the firing begins, the firing squad begins. And at the end of all of this, you know what he says? Of course, what nation did I just tell you about? Lut. Lut. And you know who the first people listening to this was? The Quraysh are listening to this. And the Quraysh were listening to this. And to them, this is old history. This is not something that happened that they saw. This is old history for them. Allah says in the same ayah, وَمَا هِيَ لِلظَّالِمِينَ بِبَعِيدٍ Watch out. For anybody who does wrong, this isn't that far away. For anyone who does wrong, this isn't far away. Who should they be thinking about now? Themselves, immediately. The history lesson became alive for them. So Allah makes the Qur'an a living message, even for the kafir, even for the disbeliever, the enemy of Islam. Then He does that for us. Then of course He does that for us. The ayat that I do want to share with you today, the ayat that I do want to talk to you about, just a small selection of them inshallah, as much as we can do, I hope we can accomplish what I'm, I'm hoping to accomplish throughout the course of this, this morning really now. <laughs> right? And that is some ayat from Surah al Imran. Allah begins and, and you know, I don't want to give you a lot of background to the ayat. I want to just go right into the ayat. 
People that claim to have faith, people that claim to have Iman, if you obey or pay attention to any group from the people of the book, who are the people of the book? Jews and Christians. And Allah didn't say they're one group, they have different groups, they have different entities. If you start paying attention to any one of their groups, and you start obeying any one of their groups, what will happen? يَرُدُّوكُمْ بَعْدَ إِمَانِكُمْ كَافِرِينَ They will turn you back. After you have come to faith, after you have come to Iman, they will turn you back and make you disbelievers again. If you do that, the warning to the Muslims. Why would this warning be given to the Muslims? Do you know when Badr happened, for example? When Badr happened, one of the great leaders of uh, uh, the Christians, a Christian scholar, who refused to become Muslim, he used to live in Mecca. A Christian scholar used to live in Mecca and he refused to become Muslim. And was, I believe his name was Amir. And in the battle of Badr, he came out with the mushrikeen from the Mecca side. And he looked at the Ansar from Medina. The, the Ansar from Medina used to be Jews and Christians. And he called, he made a speech to them in the beginning of Badr. He said, you guys, come on, get back to your real religion. What are you doing joining this cult of Muslims? These Muslims. Why are you becoming part of that religion? What kind of an Arab are you? What's wrong with you? He tried to preach them back to their own religion. Of course he failed. <laughs> but he tried. And you know what? Allah says there's a possibility somebody who respected him his entire life, maybe something crossed his mind. Allah said even if you pay a little bit of attention to them, or start following them, they will take you right back. يَرُدُّكُمْ بَعْدَ إِمَانِكُمْ كَافِرِينَ And then he says, وَكَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ تُتْلَى عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتُ اللَّهِ This is why I want you to think of these ayat as living. How can you disbelieve? When you're the ones upon whom the ayat of Allah are being recited. Let me bring these ayat back to, to life now over here for us. Are the people of the book saying all kinds of horrible things about the Qur'an? They are. They're saying that on TV. They're saying it in classrooms and colleges. They're writing about it in blogs and in newspapers. All around us we're hearing all kinds of filth coming from the people of the book. وَلَا تَسْمَعُنَّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَذَنْ كَثِيرًا You're gonna hear a lot of really painful words from them. Basically Allah tells us. They're gonna say some really hurtful things. We're getting to hear those things nowadays. And you know what's happening? Some of our young people, they're starting to listen. They're starting to say, yeah, the Qur'an does have some contradictions, doesn't it? I, I read that on a website. Brother, I have some questions. Why do we believe in hadith? Because they seem to have a lot of problems. Brother, what about this ayah of the Qur'an? You know how many of those questions I get a day? Where do the Muslims learn those questions? Where do the Muslims learn those questions? They didn't learn them from Muslims. They didn't learn them from some Islamic website. Directly from the people of the book. You start paying attention to them. You start caving in. And what do they start doing? They start eating away at your faith. And I am telling you as a fact, as a fact, a good chunk of our population of young Muslim, you know, uh, the Muslim community, the younger of our Muslim community, have already been exposed to these things, and they've already got doubts in their head, and those doubts are so strong, they're afraid to ask their parents, because their parents might freak out, and some of them have already asked their parents, and their parents are going crazy, they're coming to the Imam and saying, my son just asked me something about the Qur'an, I don't know, I never read the Qur'an, I don't know what to tell him, <laughs> you know, can you help him? And the Imam says, go make, make wudu. <laughs> Not every imam, but your problem be solved. The guy's like, I've got a philosophical question about the seerah. I don't think wudu is going to help that, that issue. And he says, you know, just pray a couple of rakah, etc, etc. It's a spiritual problem. It may be a spiritual problem, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be able to answer it intellectually. That's not true. And when we're not able to answer our children's questions, what happens next? They are convinced we don't have an answer. 
And they're not just convinced that we don't have an answer. They start becoming convinced Islam doesn't have an answer. Allah doesn't have an answer. His Messenger doesn't have an answer. The Quran doesn't have an answer. And when that happens, on the outside you're seeing a Muslim. And on the inside, وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُولِثُ الْكِتَابَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ لَفِي شَكِّ مِنْهُ مُرِيمٌ On the inside, those who inherited the book after them are in doubt. Those who inherited the book are in doubt. Can you understand how scary that statement is that Allah made? People who came into the religion from their parents, they inherited the religion, are doubtful because they weren't taught properly. Because the elders in that generation were too busy arguing. Man, that's a scary concept. That's a scary reality. Allah says in this ayah, they will take you back and make you kafirin. They will take you back and make you disbelievers. And then he says, how can you become disbelievers? It's impossible for you. How can you disbelieve? You know, this, this kind of question, parents ask that to their children. Your, child, your, your child, you know, they... By the way, if you get bad grades as a kid, and you get the report card, you get a C or something, if you do what is known to be best practices, you try to smudge the C as much as you can first. <laughs> then you try to write an A on top of that. Then spill a Coke on the grade report before handing it to your parents, right? But if your parents still find out that you got a C, they say, how can you get a C? How can you get a C? I got a tutor for you. I did this and this and this. You know? How could you get, I bought you a PlayStation. Well, that's why he got a seat. He got him a PlayStation. <laughs> I even got you a PlayStation. Right? But Allah asked this question, how could you disbelieve? How could you people? You're, it's impossible for you. Why is it impossible for you? And you're the ones, you're the ones, the ayat of Allah, the miraculous signs of Allah, the revelation of the Quran is being read on to you. The fact that it's being read on to you makes it impossible for you to be manipulated. It makes it impossible for you to be corrupted. There's only one problem. When it's being recited on to us, do most of us get it or no? No. When we don't get it, it doesn't open up our mind. It doesn't open up our heart. It doesn't give us understanding. It doesn't give us the answers we're looking for. And when those answers are not given, then this ayah doesn't give us the solution we're looking for. This ayah has given us the secret of how we're going to fight the influence of the outside. You know, a lot of Muslims, their strategy of fighting the influence of the outside is, don't go to that website. That guy's corrupt. This one hates Muslims. This is what they say. This is what the prophet. Instead of worrying about what they say, you know what, we should worry about what Allah says. If we got educated in that, those things will become a joke to us. They will become a joke automatically. It's because we ourselves aren't equipped with the ayat of the Qur'an. You know, تُطْلَ عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتُ اللَّهِ وَفِيكُمْ رَسُولُهُ And the added adventure, the advantage of the, the Sahaba was, Allah said, how can you disbelieve? The ayat are being read on to you, and among you is the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's right among you. How can you walk away? How can you do it? And then he adds, now on the other side, وَمَنْ يَعْتَصِمْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ هُدِيَ إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Whoever holds on to Allah tight for protection, you know, i'tisam is used in Arabic when you're like, you know, if, if you're uh, in a hurricane or in a storm and you're holding on to something so the winds don't blow you away, or you're caught like you fell off the ship and you're holding on to the anchor so the ocean doesn't eat you up, this is i'tisam. You're holding on to it for dear life. Allah says, whoever holds on to Allah for dear life, he's the one that's been guided. In other words, our religion is not like any other religion. Our religion, you cannot hold on to it casually. You hold on to it how? For dear life. You hold on to it tight. You don't just say, uh, yeah, I'm a little Muslim. You know. I'm a, we have a lot of Ramadan Muslims. I don't hate on you guys. Welcome. <laughs> you know. I'm not hating on you. And you'll see that in the course of today's conversation. But we have people that have decided not to hold on tight. To Allah's book, to Allah Himself. And Allah here didn't even say they hold on tight to the laws of Allah. They hold on tight to the teachings of the Quran. He just said they hold on tight to Allah. They hold on tight to Allah. So I want to talk a little bit about holding on tight to Allah. What that means. For myself and for all of you. It's very simple. It's not a complicated lesson. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a story. I made it up. So don't try to find out who it was. I made it up. 
So I'm driving with a friend. And my friend has a habit of talking behind people's back. He just has a habit of like, man, that guy's so stupid. You know what he said the other day? Oh my God. And that one's so ugly. And I, you know, he's just talking behind people's back. And he's driving, and I'm in the passenger seat. He's driving, I'm in the passenger seat. I said, man, fear a lot. Come on, man, Allah is listening. When he, when he talks behind people's back, I just say, Allah is listening. He says, I know, I know, but I'm saying. <laughs> right? Then we're driving, and he going, he's going a little fast, and there's a cop behind a tree. I say, yo, cop. And he goes, oh! And he slows down. When I said, Allah is watching, Allah is listening, what did he say? Ah, I got this. Yeah, I know. When I told him a cop is watching, what did he say? Oh, Sam. Astaghfirullah. <laughs> right? What does that mean? You're aware of the presence of a police officer. You're aware of the presence of things you can see. But you're not very conscious, not very aware, not very careful of realities you don't see. Allah is a reality we don't see. Just because we don't see Him, it doesn't mean that He's not there. It doesn't mean that He's not listening. It doesn't mean that He's not a witness to everything we're doing. And you know, I'll tell you one more thing about that, being, holding on to Allah. Have you ever been to a, a party or something, and there's three of you that are talking, but there's really two people talking, and one person is completely being ignored, like they're not even there? And that one's usually you, right? <laughs> Because you know, people don't like you that much, so they just don't talk to you much, so they're talking to each other, and you feel like insulted. Especially if it's an elder, someone who deserves more respect, and you're talking right through them, you're pretending they're not even there. And you're saying things that you know they don't like. You're saying things you know they don't like, but you're still saying them anyway. Isn't that a show of disrespect? Now we're saying things out of our mouths we know Allah doesn't like. Is Allah there? Is Allah watching? Absolutely. Is Allah listening? Absolutely. Is He part of that conversation? Absolutely. You know what this is? This is someone who says Allah does big things. Allah creates mountains and trees. Allah creates the universe. Allah creates the oceans. Allah controls big disasters in the world, etc. etc. But I, me, little guy over here, he's not going to worry about my little conversation with my friend. That's not the case. Allah is not just into macro management, He's also got the micro things concerned, taken care of. He's, he's watching our conversations too. So when we talk about holding on to Allah, it has to become a conscious thing for you and me. That I know Allah is there, that I, I know Allah is watching what I'm doing. And you know the way you can prove it to yourself? I'll give you a, a formula, you can prove it to yourself. You don't go have, have to go ask anybody else. Whether you reach the state where you actually believe Allah is listening and Allah is watching. You can prove it to yourself whether you have that recognition or not. When you're by yourself at some point in the day, turn your phone off, get off Facebook, get off Twitter, get off the text message, turn, put it on airplane mode, don't put any of the games on, don't be around any other human being, talk to Allah. Tell Him what you did today. Tell Him what you're sorry for. You don't have to tell him in Arabic, it's okay. He understands all languages. You can even tell him in Punjabi. <laughs> tell him what you did. Converse with Allah. And if you feel weird, when you're talking to Allah, like, am I like a psycho or something? <laughs> you know? Then you know you've got a problem. Because you're not so sure if he's listening. Then you've got a problem. If you can honestly talk to Allah, if I can honestly turn to Allah and actually just confess. You know how you go to the therapist and confess? If you can confess to Allah, I am telling you, the way you feel about Allah, the way you think about Allah is going to change. It's going to change. And this is the first step. وَمَنْ يَعْفَصِمْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ هُدِيَ إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Whoever holds on to Allah, then he is guided to a straight path. You know what that means? Once you decide you're going to hold on to Allah and become conscious of it and ask Him and recognize His presence in your life, then Allah will open doors for you you never thought possible. Allah will start making things easy for you. Allah will start teaching you. 
Allah will start making it easy for you to understand things. You used to have a lot of questions, and Allah will start providing you answers from places you didn't even expect. All because you decided to turn back to Him. All because you genuinely, sincerely decided to ask Allah for help. This is a, it's a, you know, it's easy for me to talk about. But really there's no way for me to check whether you're doing it or not. And there's no way for you to check whether I'm doing it or not. The only one that can help you in this case is Allah and yourself, that's it. You have to make that decision and I have to make that decision. And it's a very personal decision. And each one of us has to make it. We can't even help our children do it. They have to do it themselves. They, everybody's on their own when it comes to this. Everybody has to connect to Allah. Everybody has to talk to Allah. Everybody has to you know, respond to Allah's call. وَمَنْ يَعْتَصِمْ لِلَّهِ فَقَدْ هُدِيَ إِلَىٰ صَلَاةِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Now Allah says, and this inshaAllah ta'ala will be the, the heart of my talk with you. I know I've already taken about, I don't know how long do I have left. Oh, 40 minutes? 30 minutes? 30 minutes left? I'll take 30 minutes. I also respect attention span. And sister in the back that's sending text messages, stop. It's offensive. I'm kidding, I can't see you. But if you stop, the joke's on you. <laughs> I have to do it. I have to do it. I do it every time. Okay. Okay. So here's what I want to share with you. If you guys forget everything I talked about today, just remember this please. What I will share with you today, the heart of it, is a three point agenda. There are three points. Okay? And those three points are in three ayat. Three points Allah makes in three ayat. Step one, step two, and step three to become an incredible Muslim community. Hold on, let me finish the really interesting conversation. <laughs> Okay. I'll go on cars parked outside. Uh -huh. You can be removed because uh, say for all the cars outside of the, the oh. parking lot. Okay, people have started to tow cars that are parked outside the masjid illegally. That's it. So, yeah. So people need to, people that park their cars like they're in Pakistan. You need to, <laughs> unless you want to pick up your car from Pakistan, then that's probably the difference. You best guess to go on. So do that. Inshallah. All right. All right. So, how many items? Three items. Three items. And these three items are basically an action plan. And what is the action plan? How do we take our ummah, the Muslim community, who is not in a very, not very impressive situation? How do we take them from that and take them to where Allah wants us to be? How do we become a community that Allah wants us to be? Step one, step two, and step three. If I can get these steps across to you clearly today and remind myself of them, then inshallah I've, I've done something of my job this evening. And that is the first step. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ittaqullaha haqqa tuqatihi, wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. Those of you who have Iman, become cautious of Allah, careful of Allah, aware of Allah, protect yourself from disappointing Allah like He deserves it. You know what that is? That's an entire agenda. An entire campaign within the Muslim community where all we're asking of ourselves and others is to become aware of Allah. Careful of not making Allah unhappy. You know when Ramadan started, I'll just give you a Ramadan example of taqwa. When Ramadan started, you guys were a little fired up. Then the taraweeh, and you know what, sometimes in our masajid, the taraweeh are like, you know, this marathon. And some people who aren't used to even praying their regular prayers, then they even dish over taraweeh. You know, so that's like, you, you haven't started your car in like a year. And then you turn it on, you floor it without even giving the engine a chance. So you, what happens to you? You burn out after two days. Or after like, you know, forget 20, like two. Like, oh. You know, and they're, they're done. <laughs> right? They're finished. Now the thing I want to share with you is, this Ramadan, there's half of it left. More than half of it left. It's a huge opportunity. And I've said this before, I'll say it again. You are only, the only one you have to worry about this Ramadan is Allah. Don't worry about the guy next to you who's praying so much more than you. Don't worry about your cousin, don't worry about your friends, don't worry about your parents, don't worry about anybody else. Just worry about Allah this Ramadan. Look, shaitan's not there to distract you. That's a huge opportunity. Because every time you try to talk to Allah, what does shaitan do? 
interrupt the conversation. Hey, play the video game. Hey, call someone. Hey, text them. Hey, check if somebody put a thumbs up on your Facebook comment. <laughs> check, check, check. You're talking to a lion salad and you're wondering, thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up or thumbs down? You know, that'll happen. Not in Ramadan though, because he's chained up. So you have an opportunity to become cautious, aware of Allah. And that's something we have to give, like as a message. Now, whether I am aware of Allah, cautious of Allah, careful about Allah or not in my life, can you check, can you gauge that by looking at me? No. The size of my beard, your hijab, you know, it, the way you recite Quran, the level of your Arabic, none of these things mean anything. This is on the outside. Taqwa, consciousness, awareness of Allah is where? On the inside. Which means when the guy walks into the masjid and he has no beard, or a girl walks into the masjid and she has a hijab on and you know she's not really experienced in putting her hijab on. And you can tell that she had a really hard time making it stick somehow. <laughs> right? You don't pass them and say, these people could use some taqwa. No, 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 no. No, no, no. It's not up to you. It's not up to you. You remind others and yourself. And the Prophet والسلام, said the most beautiful words. Usikum wa nafsi I counsel you and myself of the taqwa of Allah. He's telling him, I'm telling you, you should be aware of Allah, but I'm also telling myself. I'm also telling myself. It's such wisdom in those words. It makes it impossible for you and me to judge people. All you want to do to tell people is to become aware of Allah and you remind them, I'm not just telling you for you, I'm telling, you, telling myself also. Here also, in this campaign, there are many wisdoms. It's not the evening to share all of them, but at least one of them I want to highlight. When you and I try to remind people about Allah, especially close family members, relatives, friends, people that know us personally, they always think that we have some kind of other agenda. They never just think that we're trying to call them to Allah and say, what do you really want? I'll give you the example of Shu'aib alayhi salam. Shu'aib alayhi salam. Shu'aib alayhi salam used to deal with people that were really big business people. And I'll tell you something else about Shu'aib alayhi salam. He used to live in a city that was a, like an intersection. Madian was an intersection. So if you want to do business between Egypt and Iraq, you would stop in Madian. Between East and West, and the, like the pit stop would be that. If you want to do business between Syria and the other side, you have to stop in between and you stop in Madian. So East, West, North, South, the middle airport, if you will, was Madian. Now you know what happens at airports, right? You ever been to an airport? Especially the airports that are hubs, that a lot of flights stop and then they go somewhere else. You ever try to buy candy at an airport, same price as the grocery store or no? Water, candy, food, clothes, anything is what? Twice the price, three times the price. You know why? Because they know these guys are traveling. If they need it, they don't have a choice. Where are they going to go? So we can build, you know, put a little extra on there. Seven dollars for a bottle of water. It's okay. <laughs> you know. Because, and it's not like, you know, for good business people, like if your local grocery store is expensive, nobody will go there. So they keep their prices low because they want the customer to come back. But the airport doesn't care because he knows, you're not going to come back, I'll get some other sucker. <laughs> right? Because people have to buy from me. So they were in the middle town so they could get away with price gouging. <coughs> they could get away with cheating people. Like you place an order and the guy doesn't put all the things in your bag. But by the time you check, you've already gone halfway down your journey. I'm like, oh, he didn't give me french fries. <laughs> You know? <laughs> he could do that. They used to do these kinds of things. And they were very successful at it. They were very successful at it. So Shuraib salam tried to tell them to be cautious of Allah. To be to worship Allah alone and not do this kind of stuff. You know what they said to him? Basically, I won't go into the ayat themselves, but I'll tell you the bottom line. They said to him, oh, so you want a piece of the action. You want to get rid of some of the competition. We should become careful of Allah. So you get to have some of the money. You just want a piece of the pie. In other words, he was from them. He was family. He was from the elite clans. And when he tried to give them advice, they said, you've got something else going on. There's some other reason you're doing this. And people will do that. People will question your intentions. 
When you try to remind people of Allah, one of the worst things you're going to face from loved ones is that they will question your intentions. Did the Prophet's family, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did the Prophet's family question his intentions? You, you probably just want leadership. You probably just want, some, there's something you want. You don't just want to give us this message. Right? And you know the answer that these prophets were told to give to people when they questioned their intentions? In kuntu ala bayyinatin rabbi. Same answer everybody. Even before I started talking to you about this message, haven't you noticed my character? Haven't you noticed that I never do what you guys do? Ever? So that now today that I'm talking to you, I have some credibility before I talk to you. And that's a very important point. You used to be a party animal yesterday. This Ramadan, you turn back to Allah and you've discovered Islam. And all of a sudden, you want to become the preacher in your family and tell everybody that they're wrong and that they're doing haram. Before you do, you need to get a little credibility, don't you? Before you open your mouth, before you start yelling at your uncles, right? Before you start teaching, giving them the khutbah, you come and hear the khutbah and you say, I'm going to do this at home. That's a good point, but my dad, my dad needs to hear this one. This is going to make a great point of argument, right? A lot of excited young people do that. They discover the religion, they hold on to it, and they use it to debate with family, right? When you do that, you're, you're basically abandoning what the messengers did. You have to have a little credibility first. When you turn to the religion, you become the best son, the best daughter, the best husband, the best wife. Speaking of the best husband, I want to tell you a story. A really good one on this subject. Making people conscious of Allah. You don't just invite people to have taqwa of Allah with your words. Your character says Allah. A friend of mine, he became a friend actually on a short trip, told me about how he was raised in a Muslim family. He's Guyanese origin. And in Guyana there's Muslims that are committed and there are Muslims that have mixed their religion with Hinduism. And some Muslims that are just Muslim by name and they've completely almost lost everything of the religion. They almost know nothing of the religion. And he was of the latter type. He almost knew nothing about the religion. So as he was growing up in New York, he almost completely just wasn't even practically Muslim. <coughs> and he used to you know, get into fights with his mother, he went to jail a couple of times, he was in gangs, all kinds of stuff. Later on in life he decides he wants to, you know, he's looking for God. And he knows by, at least by name he's Muslim. I think his name was Muhammad or something, right? By name he's Muslim, so he should look into what religion first? Islam. So he starts looking into Islam, starts going to the masjid, starts learning how to pray again, becomes more serious. At the time he was, you know, he had married his girlfriend who was Christian or whatever. And he starts becoming more serious about the religion. And then his wife notices that he's praying. And the beer is gone from the fridge. And he's not going out with his drinking buddies. And he doesn't go to Atlantic City on the weekends. He's a different guy. Something's changed, you know. And he doesn't say anything to her. He did, just on his own, he didn't yell at her, didn't tell her to you know, put a hijab on or whatever, lose all her friends, he didn't do any of that. He went to a scholar, and I thank the, I make dua for the scholar that he went to. He didn't tell me his name, but he said, I went to my scholar, and I told him, look, I'm becoming more and more aware of Islam, but my wife, of course, is a Christian, and she's not even a practicing Christian, she's just kind of what I was before. She's exactly like I was before. How do I help her? He said, don't tell her a thing about Islam, just be the best husband you can be, and to do that, just study what kind of a husband the Prophet was. Just do that. Don't worry about what you need to tell her. Worry about being the best possible husband. And that is the sunnah of the Messenger. The Messenger would buy his wife gifts. The Messenger would joke with his wife. The Messenger would spend time with the mother of the believers. The Messenger would praise and compliment the mother of the believers. I'm mentioning God on purpose, guys. He would compliment them. You guys eat the first first morsel of food and if you're like, mm. <laughs> and the wife says what? You go nothing, <laughs> right? You drink the, the, some of the daisies here. Drink the first little sip of lassi. You know. I know the economy's bad, but uh, are we really that short on sugar? Or, you know? <laughs> Very, diff very painful for you to say a compliment, I understand. Especially for those of you that come from my, from my original country, Pakistan. For you to give a compliment to your wife can cause an ulcer. <laughs> so, I understand. But, it's a sunnah, guys. 
good food. That's amazing. You know? And you're, we're so, our wives, our, the, the sisters are so used to hearing nasty things from us, that when we say nice things, they get freaked out. <laughs> like if the husband just says, you look really nice today. She goes, what do you want? <laughs> like, she gets worried, like, is that this, you know, we gotta fix that. I mean, that's a problem. <laughs> it, it can't be healthy. So he starts doing these things with his wife. And in the beginning, he used to argue with her sometimes about Islam. And tell her how Christianity doesn't make sense. How can three be one and one be three? All those kinds of arguments, you've heard them before, right? And none of those would work with his wife. None of them. He's like, no, no. That's, I'm a Christian and that's it. Jesus is in my heart. Leave me alone. Three years go by. He stops talking to her about Christianity and how dumb it is or whatever. Stops debating with her. He's just being what he can be as the best husband. And one day he's making maghrib and his wife joins him in salat. And he's in salat. It messes up his salat. Like, you know what? Right? What's, his, what's happening here? Right? Yeah. You're reading your break in five minutes, sure. For ten minutes, we can take Sure, sure. So, he gives, you know, he after Salat, he looks at her and he goes, What happened? And she goes, What? Nothing. And he goes, No, you have to tell me what happened. <laughs> and of course, she says what pretty much any wife would say it's complicated. <laughs> but eventually, she tells him, and she tells him, Look, I've never seen a husband like you. My dad wasn't like that. I've never seen a father like you. The way you are with our child, I've never seen a father be like that. It's so beautiful. It, this religion can't be wrong. It can't be wrong. This is ittaqullah. You see how aware you are of Allah in your life. Right? It's not how many ayat you memorize, how many hadith you know, how much knowledge you can spit out at someone, how many quotes from scholars you can deliver. It's not about that. Then how are you living your life? People can see that you are calling people to the taqwa of Allah. Hakka tu qatih. Wala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. And that's the next part. In five minutes, I have to give you a break because some people have to, you know, get their cars and park them like they would at work. Right. Um, but what I want to share with you in these last five minutes is wala tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. This is item number one. There were three items, right? This is the first item. Don't you dare die, except that you're Muslim. You know, one of the most important things we have to do as families is we have to talk about death. As families. Not in speeches, not in khutbahs, as families. When, not if I die, when I die. People say, if I die, do this, this, this. No, 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 no. When I die, do this, this, this. When I die, make sure you please make dua for me. Even to young, you know, teenage kids, early, when they're just getting their consciousness, Make them aware of death. If there's an opportunity to go to a janazah, take your family, take your kids especially. Let them see a janazah. Let them see the burial. I know about this, the sunnah about the women. But other than that, I'm talking about just actually being aware of death. And the best way to be aware of death and to be aware of our mortality also is that we have to take our children out of their comfort zones. I'm telling you, wallahi wallahi, even the ones of us that are not doing that well in this country, that have minimal you know, jobs, and are barely getting by in their apartments, we're still living like kings compared to people in the rest of the world. Our children have a lot of luxury. Even those of you that are living in small apartments, you open the fridge and there's four different kinds of soda, and three different kinds of juice. And there are people that haven't had clean water for weeks. Right? We have a lot of luxury. And our children are used to it. We're used to it. We have to take ourselves out of that sometimes. We have to take ourselves out of that. Even for a little bit. Even for a little bit. To put life in perspective again. And that's really important. Because when our children just become, and we just become accustomed to luxury all the time, and we start getting used to it, we forget what we really are. What we really are is dirt. Allah created it, us from it. And we'll go back to it. That's all we really are. And a human being forgets that. Right, the higher up he goes, he forgets where he came from. We have to remember where we came from. This is, this is the first agenda. I haven't even talked to you about the laws of Islam and prayer and hijab and beard and this. And none of that stuff. All I'm talking about is just be aware of Allah, man. Just be aware of Allah. Be aware that you're going to die. That your life has a purpose. 
And you're, you're conscious of Allah now, so He can take care of you later. You forget about Allah in this world, He'll have you forgotten in the afterlife. When you, after you die, what are you going to do? A disbeliever can deny the akhirah. A disbeliever can say there's no coming to life after death. But even a disbeliever cannot deny death itself. Death is a reality. That's going to come. If there's one thing that we, you know, makes us, you know, worry. I, I actually love Ramadan for that reason. How much time left? A couple of weeks, right? How fast does that go by? How fast? That's your entire life is going to be like that. My entire life is going to be like that. Ramadan, you know how fast it went by? That's how fast life goes by. It's a good training on how, you know how we say, only a couple of weeks left. I got to do this, 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 this. At least those of you that care. I gotta pray more, I gotta finish Quran, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. I have a little bit of time left. If you can develop that attitude in Ramadan, you should transfer that attitude to the rest of your life. <coughs> I only have a little bit of time left. I gotta get some stuff done. I gotta put this investment in place. So once I'm gone, I keep getting the credit. The sadaqah jariya, I keep getting it. From my children, from what I taught, from what I help people with. From things I, good things I did in this world. This is our first campaign for our families before anybody else. And worry about family before you worry about anybody else. If we can do that, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be ready for the next phase of this campaign that will create this beautiful society that Allah wants us to become. So with that, inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to give you guys a 10 minute break. Those of you that don't need, I know it's getting hot in here, but that's okay. Um, I'm not going to quote harsh ayat like, you know. Naru Jahanna Mashabdu Harra Hellfire is hotter Sit down No, no, no Because I've heard that before in a speech I'm like, eee That's mean <laughs> But no uh, But those of you that do have cars illegally parked Unless you're planning on walking home uh, I suggest you take care of that business But I'll, I'll, we'll pick up again in 10 minutes Inshallah we, we discussed one item, we have to discuss two more items. I do have a bit of good news, and that is that we have approximately between two and 3,000 people here, out here and outside. And that's good news and it's also very problematic because this masjid is not, this is way beyond the, the fire marshal's code. So the masjid can get into very serious trouble for having this colossal number here. And the neighbors can, you know, complain and all that kind of stuff. So as a result, we're kind of forced, just for the sake of the better of the masjid, to cut the program short. So I'm going to be, I, I know, but we have to, you know, the much is courteous, courteous enough to do that, we have to do the pro proper appropriate thing. I do promise I'll come back though, inshallah. Okay. So here, here's what I want to do. I want to spend the next 30 minutes to 40 minutes and, and wrap up the two other points. I'll make them a little more brief, inshallah, as I explain them to you. And then we'll call it an evening. And what I'll ask you to do on your own is at least, at least memorize these three ayahs. I'll give you the eye numbers at the end, and you try as like a little bit of a homework the next couple of days. Memorize these three eye I know I won't be back with you. Then they'll all come back. We'll see. Okay. All right. So our point number one was made. Second point. Hold on for dear life. Do you remember that word? Hold on to dear life with dear, for dear life to the rope of Allah all together. You know what that means? Hold on to the Quran. Hold, hold on to the Quran for dear life. We have to become a people that are just as a part of our lifestyle, we're getting more and more and more educated in the Quran. The Qur'an for a lot of you, a lot of you are not students of the Arabic language or students of the Qur'an. You're engineers, you're physicians, you're accountants, you have different professions. A lot of you are not quote-unquote religious. Right, you're here, alhamdulillah, and we appreciate your presence here. But nonetheless, you don't necessarily categorize yourself as someone who's actually sat down and tried to study the Qur'an. And even if you did try to study the Qur'an, maybe the case was that you know you started reading like the Yusuf Ali or the Pekfal translation or something, and the moment you read, you know, hast thou not seen it, you know, you know, and woe is me or something, you know, and you're like, okay, I'm done with this because I can't even, you know, first of all, I speak poor English. <laughs> and then on top of that, Shakespearean English, so I'm done with this, right? So a lot of people even that try, it becomes very difficult for them to actually properly understand. And then even the translations that are easy to understand, <coughs> sometimes the translations themselves are confusing because the subjects keep changing, 
Or what is Allah talking about here anyway? I don't understand this example. I don't understand this, this issue. Why is Allah talking about fighting? What's the point of fighting anyway? Why is He mentioning so many times? You know, why, why talk about hellfire? Why talk about this or that? All these questions come up when you're trying to read or study the Quran. And I want to tell you that this is actually a, a necessary key. Becoming familiar with the Quran as a nation, meaning as individuals, as families, as communities, and eventually as a nation. Becoming familiar with the Quran as second nature is a necessary part of us becoming a healthy ummah once again. It's a necessary part. It's not a luxury secondary thing. It's a necessary part. This is item two on our agenda. And now, for you know, inshallah, I, I do want to announce something. I don't know if it's, it's going to be in, of interest to all of you, but I do want to announce it really quick. Um, and that is that I'm planning on doing a, uh, a program next Ramadan. And that program, inshallah, is in, it's going to be held in Dallas. So I'm going to be asking some people across the country, about a hundred people from across the country, to be making a sacrifice for the entire month of Ramadan and to actually spend Ramadan with me on our campus in Dallas, we have a little campus, and go through the entire Qur'an in translation and explanation, inshallah, and just in the month of Ramadan, in the mornings. So go through it in the mornings, inshallah. And I've already posted that on our website at bayina.com. So those of you that are interested, you can look it up, inshallah. It's called Ramadan Intensive. But anyway, the, the purpose, uh, the reason I mention that is, the purpose of that is, for Muslims to at least get familiar with the Qur'an in one shot. At least one time. And then especially for Hufaz, you know, if Hufaz did that, the way they recite Qur'an would change. It would just change. Even if they haven't done Arabic before, even then. If they have at least gone through the Qur'an, even in simple translation or simple explanation, but with another person. If they've done that, it helps tremendously. It sticks. There's something about listening to the message, it's just so much more powerful than reading. <coughs> something about it, you know. If you heard a transcript of this entire speech, you'd say, well, lame speech. Right? But it's, and it's, it's less lame when I'm talking. It's more lame when you're reading. Okay? It's just, that's how it works. So that's, the, that's one thing we have to create a campaign. There are a lot of sisters halaqat that go through the Quran in translation and tafsir. Join them. There are brothers, you know, some uh, attempts going on. Join those circles. When the Quran is being discussed in whatever capacity at your masjid, that's something that has to be done. Wa'atasimu bihabdillahi jamiyan. Then Allah says, as a result, don't fall into this disagreement among each other. You know what that means? There are so many things to disagree on. Should we pray 8 or 20? Should we go local or global? Should we have an Arab Imam or a Desi Imam? Right? Should we get, you know, a, a biryani or a baklava? <laughs> there are so many things to disagree about. There are so many things to disagree about within the Muslim community. We love picking fights. We're really good at it. But Allah has given us something, if we became obsessed with that, that will become a means by which we become united. Everybody loves Quran. Everybody loves Quran. So when we are, the focus in a community becomes Allah's book, automatically unity starts happening. Don't fall into disagreement among each other. And Allah says, وَذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ عَدَاءً فَأَلَّهَ بَيْنَ قُلُمِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَا خُفَةٍ مِنَ النَّارِ فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا Man, what beautiful words. I'll give you a scene of what Allah is describing here. He says, you should remember Allah's favor on you. You were not always like this. You weren't someone that wanted to learn Allah's book. You weren't someone that wanted to be aware of Allah. You were living life. Partying. Have you seen the one who thinks he doesn't need anybody? He doesn't care? You ever meet people like that? I call them teenagers. <laughs> right? No matter what you say, I don't care. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Anything you say, the number one response, the scariest, the death pill. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and some teenagers care so little, they can't even complete the word. They say, Whatever. <laughs> The extent of your apathy that you can't, you don't even care to complete the word. It's incredible. <laughs> right? You don't care. So you were people, you were someone who didn't care. Allah made you care. It's a gift from Allah to you. But now that you care, you know what happens? You look at everybody else who didn't change like you and you say, I can't believe these people. You know some Muslims? 
They don't even pass in Ramadan. And you were like that two years ago, man. Did you forget who you were? What's Guru Ni'matullahi alaykum? Remember the favor of Allah on you. I'll tell you a story. A personal story. When I was in, uh, in eighth grade, I spent only one year in Pakistan. I was in eighth grade. I spent eight years uh, eight year in Pakistan. I don't recommend it. So, so but when I spent eighth grade in Pakistan, I had a really good friend of mine who used to go to like uh, um, competitions together. Really good friend. And when I moved to the United States, we got cut off. We were, you know, we didn't, you know, no longer remain in contact. And years later, after I graduated high school, I was going to work one day in New York City on the subway, and I see him. I recognize him. Right? And at that point I was, you know, I, I had already gone through somewhat of a transformation and I was trying to memorize some Qur'an at that time. Right? And I saw him with his girlfriend. And I looked at him and I, I, I just saw him briefly, talked to him briefly and I left. And the entire train ride I was crying. Because I was saying, I was saying to myself, man, he went to the same school I did. You know, his parents and my parents are very similar people. You know, we are, even our grades used to be similar. What makes me deserve that I'm spending my time, even a little bit of it, memorizing Qur'an and he's heading down that path? There's, there's nothing I did to deserve this. This is only the favor of Allah. That's it. There's nothing else. You and I don't deserve what we have. We don't deserve to be here. This is a gift from Allah that we're here. And there's a lot of people who are not enjoying this gift. They don't care to be here. So instead of getting angry at those who didn't get a gift, when you see people who don't have the gift, you should remember that you do have a gift. Uthkuru ni'matallahi alaykum. You know, if you can internalize that, it would change the way you look at the world. A young Muslim girl is going to go to high school. She's going to wear hijab. And instead of looking at all the other girls that are not wearing hijab, that are dressed inappropriately, that all the boys are telling, uh, paying attention to them and telling them how beautiful they are, instead of wanting and thinking in their heads, man, I gotta wear this thing on my head. Nobody thinks I'm pretty. I wish I could take it off. But it's, you know, instead of thinking like that, she'd say, "Man, when I see those girls looking for attention from that, I remember that Allah has given me His honor. Allah has given me honor. I wish these girls had respect for themselves. Look at the gift Allah has given me, and He hasn't given them. You'd, be, you'd appreciate her Islam more instead of looking at your Islam as a burden more. It would change your attitude. When the guy in college is going to be his friends are going to be like, "Yo, man, let's go to the party, party, bro." Like, no, no, it's, it's Ramadan. Man. Call me two weeks. It's Ramadan. Right? Right? I hope you don't do that. So, but you like, no, 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 I'm not. I'm, I'm really Muslim now. Right? I'm not going to do it. Instead of being like, man, Muslim can't party. You know, instead of that, you'd be like, Allah has gifted me to not walk straight into hell. He's gifted me to save myself. This is a gift. And if you remember that, you will never, ever, ever look down on people. You won't judge people. You won't look down on people. Because you'll know this is a gift from Allah, not something you deserve. You know? You used to be enemies to each other. These people, a lot of them were not just enemies. Even, they were, even if they were friends, Allah is saying, even then they were enemies. How come friends can be enemies? If your friends are making you do things that get you to hell, then right now they're friends. But on judgment day, what will you be calling them? Enemies. You made me, you destroyed me. In Kittara Turbeen, there's a guy who was Muslim, and his friend was a kafir, and the, the disbelieving friend tried to mess his Muslim friend up. But he failed. And on judgment day, the Muslim is in heaven, and the kafir is in hell, and he's looking at his old friend, and he's saying, man, you almost tripped me up. <laughs> oh, thank God, I didn't listen to you. This is actually a story in the Quran, so it's odd. Oh, this guy makes it to Jannah, he's hanging out with his friends, and he goes, where's that guy? Where's old Mikey? You know? Like, he's not here. So he asks Allah, and Allah, basically in Jannah, you get whatever you want, right? So he wants to see his friend. But where is his friend? He's in hell. So I said, fine, I'll, I'll grant you a wish. I'll let you talk, I'll let you talk to him. So let, if this person's in Jannah and he gets to talk to his friend in, because he misses him from dunya that days. And then he remembers, oh, you're the one who used to say, man, you're being stupid, man, you're young. Enjoy life. Why, you gotta, why can't you eat food? It's hot, man. Drink something. Why are you not going to go talk to that girl? She just looked at you. Go talk to her. You know? 
That was your friend. And you didn't listen to him. You didn't give in to him. And that same friend you tell him, you almost took me over. You almost pushed me off the cliff like yourself. Thank God I saved myself from you. This, you used to be enemies to each other. And he caused a love between your hearts. Even He even created a love between those who don't believe in us. Meaning out of love of them, we don't support them in their evil. Not just that we love each other, but even we, we love the rest of humanity too. When we try to tell people, humanity about not falling into evil, it's not because we think that we're better than them. It's not because of that. We don't give them da'wah to Islam, an invitation to Islam because we think we're better. Because it's supposed to be out of love for humanity. It's supposed to be out of concern. The angels came to destroy the nation of Lut. You know how they destroyed them, I already told you. But before they went to destroy, they made a pit stop. They had two deliveries to make. One delivery was at Ibrahim's house, السلام, then they had to go to take care of Lut. And it's awesome. They have to stop at Ibrahim's house and say, congratulations, you're having a baby. And then they have to go to Lut and say, congratulations, we're going to kill everyone here. <laughs> <laughs> Same angels. They got to make two stops. Amazing delivery, right? So they stop and they make this, they announce. It's a really amazing conversation. But I won't tell you about that conversation another day, inshallah. Amazing conversation. But after Ibrahim Ali sounds like shocked, right? He's shocked that he's going to have a child. He's also shocked that these guys are here to destroy another nation. You know, actually in the ayat, they even tell him, relax, we're not here for you. We're here for this nation. <laughs> right? Because you know what happened? Back in the day, when you go to somebody's house, assassins, Assassins, they would show up at people's house to kill them. But if they came to kill them, they wouldn't eat their food. Because if they ate their food, they say, I've eaten his food, I can't kill him, it's a matter of honor. Ibrahim alayhi salam slaughters a lamb, puts it in front of them, they don't eat it. What's he doing? Uh oh. <laughs> but I would just have him move people then. He, he felt a fear from them. They said, No, 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 we're, we're, we're here for move. <laughs> that, it's a this beautiful conversation. But if, when, the, when the shock goes away, you know the first thing Ibrahim Ali says? Allah tells us, He started arguing with us not to destroy everyone in this nation. That's not even His nation. Concern for humanity. You know? Allah made nas imam over people. And we follow the millah of Ibrahim Ali We're concerned over people. All people. Not because we're better than them, because we're supposed to have a love for humanity. You know, all children of Adam Ali Listen to this guys, please. He, you have become, you have transformed by His blessing alone, by His favor alone, only because of it, you have transformed yourselves into brothers. You have become a brotherhood. You have become a sisterhood. Allah is saying the fact that we have unity with each other, we don't fight with each other, we don't hate on each other, we don't talk behind each other's back, we have a genuine love for each other only because we say La ilaha illallah, that is only happening because it's a special gift from Allah. Allah already said He gave that gift. After He gave us this gift and we still backbite and we still fight and we still hate and we still talk to each other in insulting ways, then we are kicking down the road the gift that Allah has given us. Allah gave us this gift of brotherhood. Allah calls it وَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانًا وَلَمْ يَقُلْ أَصْبَحْتُمْ إِخْوَانًا بِنِعْمَتِهِ A special language here. He's saying it's only by Allah's favor that you become brothers. Only by Allah's favor. And so when we refuse to become brothers, when we refuse to forgive each other, when we refuse to create unity in a community, refuse to stop judging people, and hating on people, and backbiting people, when we refuse to do that, we are disregarding this amazing gift that Allah gave us. You never do this with anybody else. Somebody comes to your house and gives you an expensive gift. They say, oh, thank you so much. Check it out. You don't do that. Allah gives you this gift. Next time, you're, 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 the, the words that come out of your mouth, that can destroy a brotherhood. Think twice before what comes out of your mouth. You know, there's an Arab poet who says, I wish my neck was a mile long. Yeah, what kind of weird wish is that? You know what that means? A bad word comes out of my heart, and it's eventually going to go through my neck and out of my mouth. I wish my neck was a mile long, so while it's traveling, I can say, wait, send it back down. So he says, I wish my neck was a mile long. That's what he means. Right? 
That, so we need to be careful how we say things. In the shaitan la yanzahu bainakum. You should say the best possible thing. Shaitan will cause fighting among you. Just from words. From words. We have to be careful what we say and how we say it. And he says, وَكُنْتُمْ وَكُنْتُمْ دَاخِلْ وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَى حُفْرَةٍ مِنَ النَّارِ You guys were at the hufra, at the, at the edge of a pit made of fire. You didn't realize it. You were living your life and you were like, one half of your foot is dangling on the other edge of the open air. And underneath is fire. That's where you were. فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا He pulled you back from it. He rescued you from it. فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ آيَاتِهِ That is how Allah clarifies His miraculous signs. Allah is trying to make something clear to you. You didn't deserve to be the way you are. You were headed straight for hell. You were right there. And Allah decided, I'm going to pull you back. You didn't make that decision, Allah did for you. Allah gave you that gift. Our brotherhood is part of that gift. Our communities are part of that gift. Our masajid are part of that gift. Appreciate the gift Allah has given us. وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَى شَفَى خُفَّةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِنْهَا كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ آيَاتِهِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَحْتَدُونَ Amazing conclusion too. That is how Allah clarifies His ayat to you, His messages to you, His miraculous signs to you. So you can now become committed to guidance. Now become serious. This was step two. Step two was hold on to the Qur'an and use that as an excuse to create brotherhood. Use as an, as an excuse to create unity. You know what we're seeing here tonight? This is not Nuhal Ali Khan. This is the power of Qur'an. This is Qur'an. It can create unity. We don't even know each other. But I, I sense a genuine brotherhood. You, you feel it too. This is powerful. This is what Qur'an can do. So you can become committed to God. You can feed off of each other's energy. And you can become more and more serious. And more and more committed to the direction that Allah wants you to go into. Our, the final step, if we get to do this step, and we have a healthy community, and we have brotherhood among each other, then we are ready for the next step. You don't go to the next step until you take care of step one and step two. Eventually we'll be at step three. What's step three? وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ Out of you, a group should rise. They should be made up of people from you. And their job will be to call people to good things. They'll be always inviting people to good things. In other words, not every one of us is going to hit the podium. But there will be a group that will come from us. When the brotherhood is created, talent and talents will be identified, and we're going to hone those talents, and the entire community is going to invest in those talents, and they're going to rise. And they're going to call people to good. Can you imagine young people from our community, our own community, one day giving the khutbas, one day inviting people to good, one day going and, and going on talk shows and responding to people that are hating on Islam. <coughs> Our own kids that are born and raised here. Can you imagine that day? It's an incredible thing. When they're from among you. <coughs> calling to the good. Probably one of the most misunderstood concepts in the entire Quran. Actually I was going to spend about an hour and a half just on this tonight, but I can't. Just on وَيَأْمُرْنَا بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَا عَلِ الْمُنْكَرِ But I'll summarize what I can for you. The, the translation says most of the time, they command the good and forbid the evil. How many people have heard that before? Command the good, forbid the evil. Right? You've heard that before, right? Very, very shallow translation. يَأْمُرُونَ means, it's a spectrum of things. أَمْرُ means suggesting something, advising something, trying to convince someone to do something, you know, encouraging someone to do something, and commanding someone to do something. Is there a difference between suggesting and encouraging and commanding? There is, right? It starts with suggestion. And you know there are different situations. I give you a real life, it's a really simple example. I love simple examples. Or I think they're simple. Right? Dinner's ready. I'm gonna call my dad to dinner, and I'm gonna call my son to dinner. Dad is downstairs, son is upstairs. I'm going to say to my son, dinner's ready. I'm going to say to my dad, Baba, uh, dinner's ready. <laughs> I did amr in both cases. In one case I used authority. In the other case I used respect, request, right? Two different things. Two different situations. Amr bin ma'roof depends on the situation. You don't go commanding people. You don't take out your, you know, your haram gun and haram, 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 haram. <laughs> Everything's haram. 
We can't do that, don't do that, no, no, no. And we have unfortunately some of this social constipation in our massages in some places. But we have it, I know it is a bad term, but I feel that way. Like it's almost like you can't even be happy in a masjid. Like if you smile and say, Salaam Alaikum. <laughs> masjid. <laughs> no happiness here. Like, oh man, masjid goes to your place to be happy. Don't, don't be judgmental on people. Don't just, you know, tell people, you should be doing this, that's haram, you know, that's not right, you know. And the guy, you know, this happened in a masjid recently. His, his youth came to the masjid in Ramadan, last Ramadan. And some of these kids have never been in a masjid. Like, they're Muslim, but they've never been in a masjid. Ever. The kid walk, walks into the masjid, he's got a couple of earrings. You know? He's got tattoos. What do, what do some of our incredibly wise <laughs> members of the community do? That's haram. <laughs> he's like, what, my ears? Come on, what do you want me to pull it off? You know, then you're gonna say it's uh, your salat is not accepted, you're bleeding. <laughs> what are you probably gonna do? But you can't go around telling people what to do. Your first job, your first job is to instill people in awareness of Allah. Everything else will fall into place. Remember step one? So what does Amr bin Ma'ruf really mean? It means call people to good, decent behavior. Encourage people to do the right thing. Don't worry about the finer details. Don't, they will happen. They will take care of themselves. Worry about the big things. You know, there's, you, can, you can correct someone on how high their pants are, and you can try to advise someone to get out of a liquor store. Which is a priority. Think about that. You know? You, you're correcting someone? No, 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 no. You need to pray all 20. Or don't come at all. Seriously? Okay, alhamdulillah. The situation outside is under control, they're saying. Alright, alhamdulillah. Tabir! Allah! Yeah, we can, we can go on. But, uh, yeah, we can. Okay, so what was I saying? Something about Islam? Yeah, priorities. Priorities. When you're gonna bring up an issue, make sure it's an issue of priority. There are finer details in our deen. Brother, the way you're making wudu is not correct. It may be true. The way you're making wudu is not correct. That's not the way to bring it up though. That's not the way to bring it up. That's not Amr bin Ma'roof. That's just you trying to show people that you know more than them. That's just you inflating your own ego. Don't do that. And eventually when we become a community of encouraging each other to do good, and I tell you what that is. I'll give you some practical examples of what you should be encouraging people to do. Tell people how are you how are you raising your kids? What do you plan on doing with the kids? You know, even for Muslims that aren't practicing the religion, even they're worried about their children, right? Even non-Muslims are worried about their children. And so when we bring that priority, then people actually that concern for our children is an actual easy vehicle by which people can start coming closer to the religion too. Coming closer to becoming more serious about their meaning. يَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُونَ وَيَنْهَوْنَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرُ We forgive, forbid all disgusting vile things. Before you talk about halal and haram issues, which most of you and I are not qualified to talk about anyway, let's talk about evil things first. Outright evil things. What are evil things? These are things like shamelessness in the media. Shows that make fun of prophets. And our kids watch them. And they have no problem with it. The kind of munkab that's going on nowadays, I feel, is, you know, I don't necessarily come out and say Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff is haram, because I don't think personally, I don't see that it's forbidden. But I do see that Muslims are, they have no standards. We have no standards in how we talk. When somebody says something and you want to put a comment about what they said, most of the time it's a compliment or an insult. You tell me, compliment or insult? Insult. Most of the time you want to say something that puts somebody else down. This is just not how a Muslim talks. We just don't talk like this. That's not how we're supposed to communicate. This is a kind of bunka. You're just creating bad feelings among each other. You're making a culture out of making fun of each other. Don't let any group make fun of another group. Don't do that. That's just not how you should do. Right? Another munkar is just how much we're allowing our standards to drop in what we watch on TV and what we, what we watch in movies. We allow ourselves to say, There's only, it's only PG-13. 
It's only R, but it's only got one bad scene. Everything else is fine. Did you see the special effects? I mean, who of you is going to go on Judgment Day? You're being interrogated about the movie and say, Did you see the special effects go? It's amazing. Nope. At that point, it's not worth it. Stop making excuses. Stop making excuses. And one of, the, one of shaitan's jobs is to make bad deeds no big deal. So when somebody says, you know, that's a really bad idea, the first thing shaitan will put in your head is, come on man, lighten up. Relax. Everything's around for you. Live a little. You won't be saying that later on. You'll be saying that now. This is, this is the essential message of Qur'an. وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْحَوْنَ عَلَى الْمُنْكَرِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And those are the ones that are truly successful. The rest of my conversation with you guys will be about this ayah. And how we can create a culture around this ayah within the Muslim community, within every single masjid in the country, within Houston, within the city of Houston, inshallah ta'ala. You know, and how we can become a part of that. Of, of implementing these three steps starting at the masjid. This session I want to conclude with the following statement that will give a rise to the next section, the next conversation I want to have with you as a result of this. What I want to share with you is the most important agenda of Muslims in this country is to raise a good family. We have no other agenda than that one. To, to be the best husband we can be, to be the best wives we can be, to be the best mothers and fathers we can be, to raise the best sons and daughters we can raise. And to be the best sons and daughters we can be. This is our number one agenda. There's no other agenda. The institution of families under attack, it's being destroyed, it's caving in from the inside, and we have to protect it. <coughs> now this institution of family, you know what gives it strength, what supports it? Is the masjid. The masjid, protects the family. That's what it's supposed to do anyway. The masjid is a place where you're supposed to be involved not as just a man, not as just a married couple, not just for the boys. It's supposed to be a place for the entire family. It's supposed to be where families learn their religion, where they learn to meet other Muslims and create a culture of Islam. What's the other place you're going to meet Muslims? Regularly. The weekly convention Muslims have is the Jum'ah prayer. Right? That's, so it has our, our families need to be connected to the masajid. Now, the other thing is our masajid cannot survive until they have involvement from the entire family. When our masajid only have involvement from the men, fights break out. When our masajid only have involvement from some group from the community, fights break out. When the masajid have involvement from the entire family, the priorities stay straight. We do things for kids, we do things for women, we do things for men, we take care of every element of a community. So the community needs the family, and the family needs the community. They both need each other. If you try to raise a family disconnected from the masjid, disconnected from... When I say community, I actually mean masjid. Please understand. When I say com community, I mean masjid. When you try to raise a family that's practically disconnected from the masjid, disconnected from the community, you are asking for trouble. Because over time, it will become easier and easier for you to let go of more and more of the religion. Families that moved out to some random boondocks where the dad got a job and there's no masjid out there and he's raising his kids by himself, only Muslim family, two Muslim families in the entire town. After 10, 15 years when their kids are teenagers, they're the ones that are writing emails that you can sense the tears when they were writing them. What should I do with my kids? I don't know, I, I don't know what happened between me and my wife. Because there was no community. So the family started falling apart. We need each other. You know, uh, the communities in Texas have a huge advantage. We really do. We have a huge advantage. I come from New York. We don't have that kind of advantage, I'm telling you. Most communities, we don't have that advantage. We have an, Im an immense advantage here. We have the opportunity, we have all the ingredients, we got to use them though. we got to put them together now. It's not, we're just getting started. The, the massages have been built by the, by the mer mercy of Allah. Now it's time to bring them to life. Now it's time to fill them with our families. So inshallah we'll talk pra practical steps about that and some really important considerations that all of us need to have in, in developing healthy communities inshallah ta'ala. After our break, I'll give you guys a 10 minute break. Is that the official verdict? 10 minutes? I'll take 15. Go make some long distance phone calls. So. I'll talk to you in 15 minutes. So I want to talk to you. The last time brothers ask questions and sisters have questions, they're welcome to ask, inshallah.
When somebody joins a cult, the cult says your family is part of fitna. You should stay away from them. They take you away from deen. Your family is dunya, it's worldly. You don't, don't worry about your family, worry about deen. The community says, no, your family is part of your deen. Making your family better, taking care of your family, spending time with your family is a part of your religion. You have to do it. You have to be a good dad and a good husband and a good father and all, all this stuff, a good mother. You know? So where a community makes family stronger, a cult can destroy families. A cult can take people away from their families. Fathers will no longer act like fathers. Husbands will no longer act like husbands. They don't fulfill their roles. A lot of masjids across America are cults. And very, very few masjids across America are communities. We have to make the effort of making all of the masajids across the country into communities. You know the last comment I made in my last session? You can't have the masjid operate properly without having one involved. Family. family. When you have family involved, it won't become a cult. It won't become a cult. It can't. When your family is uninvolved, there's just some people involved and one or two personalities dominate and it starts becoming a cult. And it just gets hijacked and then <coughs> some personalities take over the show. And that's what ends up happening. And everybody means well in the beginning. But this is not how the world operates. We have to make an extra effort to create communities. To create communities. It's, very, it's a big priority. Huge priority for us in this country. So I wanted to start our conversation from that. And then I want to take you to this, just some practical components of Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi al Munkar, the last thing we talked about, and then move on to the next ayat that are coming since we have time. The three main points I wanted to make to you once again, these ayat numbers are uh, 103, 104, and 105. Okay? Abu Halayam, third surah. وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِقُونَ And those are the ones that are truly successful. These people have an opportunity to reach the ultimate success. Those who command the good and forbid the evil and inspire to do so. And of course, forbidding the evil, I didn't talk much about that. This is what I want to explain to you, this concept of forbidding evil in Islam. What does it mean? You know, Al-Munkab is something that is recognized by everybody as evil. In Arabic, the word Munkab means something that is recognized by, or is alien to, is indecent to everyone. Muslim or non-Muslim, everybody sees this wrong. Murder is wrong. Innocents being killed is wrong. Cheating people out of their homes is wrong. Right? Subprime mortgages are wrong. They are. Everybody sees it now. Everybody sees it. These are, these are loan shark practices. Right? These are criminal practices. Should I move over? Is that what the problem is? Oh no. Right? Alcoholism is wrong. It's wrong. Drug abuse is wrong. These are things that are wrong and everybody knows it. This is Munka. When we think of Yanhauna Anil Nahi Anil Munka Muslims, average Muslims, you know what they think of? That guy's not eating the Bihami. <laughs> that guy, his beard is a little too short. You have a longer. We worry about these things, and I'm not saying we shouldn't worry about those things. I'm saying they're bigger priorities. And those are the priorities that are priorities for an entire society. If it's of concern to the entire society, it is ma'roof and munkar. So what we're calling people to is not just relevant to the Muslims, it's relevant to everybody. Universal definitions of good and evil. That's what the Prophet called towards in Makkah. If you look at the Prophet message, besides the message of faith, you know what he's talking about? Why did you bury a baby girl? Even a non-Muslim can recognize that burying a baby girl alive is a crime, right? Even a non-Muslim can recognize that when you cheat people in business, it's wrong. Isn't that true? Now the thing is, and this is where this, this conversation gets difficult. Muslims nowadays, for the most part, when we speak out, about something, when we rally about something, when we, we, when we cry bloody murder about something, it is usually about something that has been done unjustly to us. It's usually about some kind of injustice that is happening to Muslims. 
Compare that to what the Qur'an was telling the Prophet to speak out against Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam First and foremost The Qur'an commanded the Prophet to speak out against injustice itself Injustice And a lot of these injustices were not even happening to the Muslims They were happening to other people in Quraysh When Shu'ayb was telling people, his nation, don't cheat people in business Were they cheating Muslims in business? These were kuffar, if you want to use that term, non-believers, deniers of truth, cheating other deniers of truth in business. So you say, they're going to have anyway, who cares? No, no, no. <laughs> no. Then he called out a universal evil. He addressed the universal evil. This concept is very important for us to understand. We're not just another lobby. I'll say that again. Muslims are not just supposed to be another lobby. There are lobbies in Congress, there are people that speak out about, you know, you know animal rights activists, gay rights activists, you know, the, the Hispanic community has their own lobby and their own activists, the Jewish community has their own activists, and so we say we should have our own lobby and our own activists and our own, you know, agenda. Our agenda is supposed to be justice. Not just for ourselves. Actually, it's not even starting with ourselves, it's supposed to be for everybody else. The first people who should speak out against the crimes of alcohol abuse is Muslims. Not for the sake of Muslims, but for the sake of the criminals that, that are hurting and are victimizing the society because of alcoholism. If you know any physicians that work in the ER, the emergency room, and they, their shift is Friday and Saturday night, ask them about the harms of alcohol. They can tell you. They can tell you what they see coming into the, through the doors in the ER on Friday and Saturday night because of what, 99% of the time, because of what? Alcohol. They can tell you what kind of evil that is. The, people, the first people who should speak out against women's abuse, child abuse, the first people who should speak, about, against, speak out against you know, criminal practices of major banks, even if you're not a victim, you should speak, you and I are supposed to be speaking out against it because we're Muslim. We speak up on behalf of the oppressed. That is how the Prophet was known, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was known as a problem because he was speaking on behalf of people who cannot speak for themselves. Nowadays, our concept of Amr al-Ba'roof and Nahi an al-Munkar has been reduced to only speaking about rights and wrongs that are being done regarding the Muslims themselves. That is not the original discourse. I'm not saying that's not valid. But I'm saying definitely that that is secondary to something more primary. Our primary objective has always been to be well-wishers for the society in which we are. In uridu illa al-islah. I want nothing but reform. I want nothing but except what's better for the society. That's what we want. That's what the Muslim is supposed to be known for. That's not what we've become. How do you become like that? You become like that when first you become conscious of Allah, then you connect to Allah's book, then you become a community that's healthy instead of being your cult, now you're ready for Amr al-Ma'roof and Nahi Anil Munka. Then you're ready for that. Then we're gonna raise that generation that shows the world and shows America how beautiful Islam is. Right now we're not ready to show America how beautiful Islam is. We're not. It's really sad that we're not, but we're not. Right now, if a whole bunch of non-Muslims came to our masajid, they just walked into our masajid, we're not ready to handle them, we're not ready to deal with them. We're not even ready to deal with the Muslims that are having problems. You know, it's Ramadan. I, I told the story before, I don't mind sharing it again, you know, in a couple of, few Ramadan, four or five Ramadans ago. I was in New York, and Taraweeh is going on, and this Muslim guy, drunk out of his mind, walks into the masjid. And while prayer is going on, he's yelling and screaming all kinds of stuff in the back. Making a, he's out of his mind, basically. He's not in his right senses. When the prayer is over, guess what happens? Take a wild guess. He gets nicely escorted outside. Police are called, and he's on his way. Ask yourself this question. If he's drunk out of his mind, chances are he was at a bar. Right? Where did he come? He left the bar and came to the masjid. As drunk as he is, 
Something in him said, maybe people of God can help me. Nobody else can help me. Maybe they can help me. And what did we do? We facilitated his trip to the police. We're not even ready to handle our own that have problems. Do you have an announcement for me? Is that me? Every time you come, I get scared and worried. <laughs> if I ever meet you again, then this is going to happen. You say, oh no, what did I do? <laughs> this happens to me all the time. You know, this, uh, I was giving a talk one time, I was really fired up. It was like the 27th of Ramadan. I was talking about the Battle of Badr. And the guy comes up to me and he passes me a note. And it was somebody's car parked illegally outside. <laughs> and the Muslims did not fear the enemy. And the enemy was license plate number. <laughs> what was I going to do? <laughs> it's too easy. <laughs> but anyway, this concept of Amr bin Ma'roof and Nahi al Munkar, I, 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 I hope I give you some glimpse of it that is bigger than what we made it to be. Now at the end of it, Allah says, Yawma tabiyadu wujuhun wa tasaddu wujuhun. There are people on the Day of Judgment that are going to be lit. So lit that they're going to be white. For, you know when light is really bright, it looks white. They're going to be that lit. Wa tasaddu wujuhun. And there are places that are just going to be dark. They're going to be darkened. You know what that means? Have you ever seen someone who failed an exam? It's like a cloud is on their face. Why do you look like that? Why are those dark circles under your eyes? Right? You must just you must have just got your report card. Right? Your grades just came out and got posted. Your Brilliant faces and darker faces. And then Allah says, <coughs> As for the people whose faces have become blackened, darkened, darkened by sadness. They're being told then, Akafartum ba'da imanikum? You people disbelieved even after you had faith? You came to learn such an amazing speech from Allah, the Quran. Allah gave you the best possible speech that could be given. And that best possible speech didn't affect you? Even then you had the treasure in your hand. Faith was in your hand. Iman was in your hands. You lost it still? فَذُوقُوا adab بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ then go ahead and taste the punishment because of your ingratitude. You deserve it. They're already sad and then they're being told, how could you fail? You already had it in your hands. How could you lose it? You know what Allah is talking about? This conversation began, وَكَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ وَأَنْتُمْ تُطْلَى عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتُ اللَّهِ How can you disbelieve? And the ayat of the Qur'an are being read onto you. The ayat of Allah are being read onto you. When the ayat of Allah are being read onto you, what do you have now? You have iman. Once you have Iman, how could you lose it? How could you become a piece, person whose face has been overshadowed on the Day of Judgment? And that kind of person, Allah doesn't just say, I'll, for, you know, I'll punish them and then I'll eventually forgive them. He just says, فَذُوكُ الْعَذَابِ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَكْفُرُونَ Taste the punishment because of your ingratitude and your disbelief. Even though this person thought while they were alive that they were Muslim. On Judgment Day, Allah calls them kafir. Uh, isn't that scary? Allah calls him kafir on judgment day. He didn't even know that Allah will call him kafir on judgment day. Allah, he didn't know that. He didn't know Allah will call him someone who engaged in this belief. But Allah calls him out like that. وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ بِيَبَّتْ وُجُوهُمْ As for those whose faces are lit, brilliant, elated, فَفِي رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Then they are in Allah's mercy. They are in Allah's mercy. هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ They will remain in it. They're going to stay in forever and ever. I'm tempted to share that entire passage with you of the friends that talk to each other, but I want to share one bit of it with you. When Allah says, Hum fiha khalidun. Remember that friend who's hanging out with his other friends? Right? He made it to Jannah. He's hanging out in Jannah. And he sees other, he sees old faces. Because you know, it's been a while since you died. Many centuries happened, and then you're raised. Then judgment day happened. Now you're finally in Jannah, and then you found your apartment or your palace, sorry. Palace. You find your, and now you invite some friends over and like your friends are hanging out together and you're like, Oh my god, I remember you, MSA! <laughs> like, I remember you from the... You made it too? Oh <laughs> But there's this... There's this reunion happening. 
Right? And in that reunion, I'm like, where's little Mikey? Remember that? And then he goes to see little Mikey in, the, in Hellfire. But he only saw Hellfire from where? From Jannah. And he only had this brief conversation with his friend. But he's still in Jannah, right? He's in Jannah, but he got to saw a little bit of Jahannam. So when he comes back, he goes, Ahaba nahnu bi We're really not going to die anymore, right? And we're going to stay here, right? He's already in Jannah. Why is he talking like this? Why are you saying we're really not going to die anymore? We're going to stay here forever? Because he just got a cleanse of the other side. So he, it's like he got back into Jannah all over again. He's so happy. He's so overjoyed. We're really not leaving here. You know, incredible. It's incredible. Compare this to the feeling, those of you that own homes. You've been saving money for a long time and eventually you buy a home. When you buy a home, you think to yourself, we're never moving from here. I love this place. When 10 years go by, 12 years go by, you say, we're never moving from here, really? Because <laughs> this is other development that came up. We have some pretty nice floor plans. They invited, one of the families invited us to eat at their house. Did you see their living room? <laughs> I wish you could move here. The thought crosses your mind. In Jannah, no, I ain't moving. It's good. It's good. You know what I'm I wish my bedroom could be a little bigger. You just have to say that to get bigger. You know, it's, all the customization is ready, ready and you know, ready to move forward. Okay. Tilka ayatullahi matluha alayka bil These are the ayat of Allah. These are the, those are the miraculous signs of Allah that we're reading on to you with truth. Truthfully, I'm telling you this is the case. I'm telling you, Allah is saying, bil haq. I'm tell, we're reading all of these ayat on to you, O Messenger, so you can read it on to the people and tell them this is really from me. It's such a beautiful ayah. Allah does not intend at all to do wrong to any, any nation. None of the nations does Allah want to do any wrong to. He doesn't want to do it. You know, in uh, Surah Buddha, I keep mentioning, there's an ayah Allah says, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ لَأَمْلَا أَنَّا جَهَنَّمَا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسَ النَّاسِ أَجْنَائِهِ The word of Allah became true, I will fill hell with jinn and human beings altogether. A huge number of them. Right? That's only the second half of the ayah. It's so unfair. People quote that part of the ayah, they don't quote the first part of the same ayah. In the first part of that ayah, Allah talks about Allah offering, opening the doors of His mercy and then saying, وَلِذَلِكَ خَلَقَهُمْ I, And some of them will enter Jannah and that's why I made them. I made human beings so they can go to Jannah. That's when the ayah began. I made you so you can go to Jannah. That's what He says Himself. Basically, the, the, the image he paints for us is he opened the door, he showed you the road, he gave you the feet you can walk with, and he said, just go straight, you'll get there. Now, if somebody knows all of that, and they still turn around and go the other way, whose fault is that? And then they say, Allah didn't want me to go to Jannah. What? What more can he... I mean, he gave you an intellect, right? And he told you, that's Jannah, doors open, I'll help you along the way if you go. Just take a step, I'll take two for you. Just take a little bit, I'll help you out. Just do a little bit. And the human being still turns away, and then when he goes to hell, he says, لَوَنَّ اللَّهَ هَدَانِي If Allah guided me, I would have been good. If only Allah helped me out, I would have been alright. What? Allah didn't help you out. Allah created you so you can go to Jannah. You understand? It's a very powerful statement. So here Allah says, وَمَا اللَّهُ يُرِيكُ ظُلْمَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah does not intend to do wrong to any, any nation at all. And you, don't you ever think, you know, whatever's happening here in this world, whatever's happening in the next world, and who, who's in charge of it, Allah alone owns the skies, the kingdom of the skies and the earth. Whether or not Muslims have victory in the world or not, Muslims are going to try to do commanding the good, forbidding the evil. Maybe they'll never get to that point where they're really doing it the way they're supposed to. Maybe not in our lifetime, Allah knows. But Allah says, whether you are able to do it or not, you should know something. I already own all the kingdoms. And all decisions are returned back to Allah. This is, this is, these are my concluding comments with you guys. 
you guys, I'm paraphrasing what Allah says now, Kuntum, all of you guys have been khayra ummatin, the best possible nation, ukhrijat bin nas, that has been brought out for people. You guys think about this. Is there a difference between saying, you are the best possible group for people? You are the best possible group from people. Is there a difference? If you're the best group for people, for people, it means you're the best qualified to serve people. If you say you're the best, best group from people, what does that mean? You're better than them. You're the best of them. Allah didn't say you're the best from them. He said you're the best for them. In other words, humanity needs help. And Allah decided there should be a, a, a percentage of the human race that should be raised and made an ummah and they will be the best qualified to help everybody else. They are there to help everyone else. That's their job. And that's why you've been chosen. I think you're the best qualified. You know what that means for you and me? There's a, there's a, the majority of the world's population is not Muslim. The fact that Allah made you and me Muslim means Allah sees something in us that He decided we should become part of this nation. And why? So that we can serve humanity at large. We can serve everybody else. Ninnas. How will you serve people? Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi. Wa tanhawna abil munkari. Wa tu'minuna bil ma'rufi. You will tell people to do decent things. You will advise, counsel, and even eventually even command to decency, to goodness. And you will forbid people, try to stop people from that which is universally evil and wrong. While you'll be believing in Allah. You're not going to be playing political games. You know, Muslims, sometimes we, we talk about how we should get involved in politics. Which is a complicated conversation, but I'll tell you something. To really get involved in politics, you have to play a dirty game, don't you? You have to get your hands dirty. You have to compromise on your principles. You have to kind of give a little and take a little. When it comes to the Muslims, Allah told the Prophet وَدُّوا they want that you give a little, so they can give a little. That's what they want. Don't give them that. We can get involved in politics, but we should understand, we should understand that our principles should never be compromised. We can't compromise even 1% of them. Because we're not in it for anything other than pleasing Allah. We're not there for the poll results. We're not there for pleasing other people. We're not there for even ourselves. We're only involved in any capacity, in anything that we do, for the sake of Allah. So anything else, we don't care. The only thing we care about is we're not going to compromise Allah's principles. What do we mean by Allah? وَلَوْ آمَنَا أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ مِنْهُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَأَكْثَرُهُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Even if the disbelievers, if the, if, if the people of the book only came to believe, it would be better for them. It's so awesome. When I travel nowadays and I sometimes look very clearly Muslim, and I'll sit next to a preacher sometimes, or somebody, they'll feel bad for me. I feel bad for you. You don't have Jesus. <laughs> I was like, actually, I do. You don't. <laughs> you know? And so it, it, they'll, they'll talk about how they, how they feel bad for Muslims. These poor people are lost. They don't have the light. Right? Allah turns on and says, if they only believed, it would have been better for them. Among them are believers, most of them are corrupt. And don't be afraid of them. They will not be able to harm you, except causing you some pain. And even if they fought you, they will turn their backs eventually. They'll turn their backs. Allah talks about this in another place. He says, The enemies of Islam that were fighting the Muslims, Allah says, they will not win in battle because they are a nation that doesn't understand. You know what that means? It means the Quraysh, they didn't even know why they were fighting. Oh, everybody hates Muslims. Let's go fight. Why are you fighting? What's your goal? What are you going to accomplish after the fight? Does it sound familiar that people will go to war and not even know why they're going to war? and forget halfway why they're there or what they should do after that or what their goals are and then keep redefining the goals <coughs> down to the fact that even the soldier says I'm only here because of my brothers my fellow soldiers I'm only here to, for, you know, for my comrades I don't really know why they're here right? this happens even today it happens even today because they have no purpose, no nothing in front of them but don't you worry, don't you worry about it 
Don't let your, yourself get concerned with those things. لَنْ يَبُرُّكُمْ إِلَّا أَدَابَ لَنْ يَمَاتِلُكُمْ يُوَلُّكُمْ الْأَدْبَابِ ثُمَّ لَا يُنْصَرُمْ I have about 15 minutes left. And so, I, I don't know when, I, when else, inshallah, I'll get a chance to speak to you in detail. But I wanted to encourage you to do something. I encourage you to think a, a certain way in, this, in these couple of sessions. My point essentially is that Allah is talking to us in the Qur'an. فِيهِ بِكُرُكُمْ In it is your mention. He's talking to you. And the Qur'an is a book about you. It's about me. And how do you identify? You know how you say, you know, I want to relate to the, the, uh, the message? You want to be able to relate to the message? The Prophet ﷺ was in a struggle. He was given a mission in life. He was given a mission. And in that mission ﷺ, he would have some problems. And whenever he would run into problems, Allah would send some of his instructions, his words, his advice, his counsel, his, his, his you know, wisdom to help the Prophet. So for example, Allah's Messenger is talking to the business people from Quraysh. Allah would send him the story of Shu'ayy and he talked to business people. Right? So for the Prophet, it's not just a story. What is he using that as? A case study for how to talk to Quraysh. You understand? If you and I don't put ourselves in the struggle of the Prophet, because the Prophet's mission, وسلم, his mission is not over. As he was leaving, he said, now it's your mission. Then the one who's here should deliver it to someone who's not here. We have to carry the message of Islam. We have to carry that message. So our life has now become a mission. And when our life becomes a mission, then Qur'an will become relevant to us. If your life is not a mission, if you don't take on the mission that the Prophet himself took on, and you take some part of it, you can't do everything, you take some part of it, then you'll start seeing Qur'an in a different light. It'll be something completely different to you. Now I have 10 minutes left. And I, this 10 minutes, imagine you heard nothing today. This 10 minutes is completely different. This completely different conversation with you guys. I want to tell you that some people, they live their life worshipping different things. Some people worship their body. They'll take care of their diet, they'll work out every day, they'll look at themselves in the mirror every chance they get. They worship their, their physical self. You know? Some people worship their athletic ability. That's all they think about. Some people worship their career. Some people worship their investments. Some people worship their appearance. Some people worship their, their entertainment. Some people worship their, you know, their, their car. Literally, their car. Some people worship their Apple products. <laughs> you know? They do. Some people worship their video games. Some people worship their, their, their... And people count things. Allah says about the Quran, Huwa khayrun min ma yajna'un is better than what you're, count, what you're gathering. Specifically, he didn't say it's better than your money. The Quran is better than your money. He said Quran is better than what you're gathering. The word gathering is really cool. Because you know what people do, right? right? People gather, back in the day, he used to gather stamps and coins. And people gather baseball cards, then Yu-Gi-Oh cards, and Yu-Gi-Oh you hockey shades, and Pokemon, and, right? All these other, I've learned so much Japanese over the last few years. People gather video games, people gather movie collections, people gather Facebook friends. People gather YouTube hits. We gather things. People get, you know, people gather money. Money is an obvious one, right? People gather awards, championship rings, certificates, certifications, right? Titles. People gather these things. People we spend our life gathering stuff. Allah says, you can have Quran is better than anything else you gather. Gather Quran. Collect Quran. Collect surahs. Memorize them. Learn them. Internalize them. Is better than anything you gather. But the, the, this 10 minute conversation is started with we are all, there are people that worship things. What that means is the most important thing in their life is something. Either it's their body, or their clothes, or their money, or their car, or their shoes, or their house, or their children, or their business, or their career, or their reputation, or their political standing. But they, this one thing becomes the obsession of their life. That's all they think about. For a Muslim, there's nothing wrong with having a nice car, nice clothes, 
taking care of your body. All of these things are fine, but that's not why we're living. That's not the mission of our life. The mission of our life is the mission of the Prophet He gave us a mission already. All of these things are only there like recess at work. You know how you take a 30 minute break at work? We came to this earth to put ourselves to work. And then in the break you can enjoy some good things Allah gave you. So you can refresh yourself, regather your energy, so you can go back to work and get to work again. But we were here to work. The message of the Qur'an is this. That's, that's the summary of it. You and I are slaves of Allah. That means we are on a mission. We can enjoy this world, but we don't live in this world for it. And there are many Muslims, Muslims, a good majority of Muslims, who don't live their life as a mission. They live their life for their house, or for their children, or for their clothes, or for their reputation, or for their social standing. And they live their lives for their careers and their businesses. They live their lives for them. You know, and there are those who have good family, good business, good house, and all, but they don't live for those things. They live for something much more important. You have to ask yourself who you are. I can't answer that for myself. Or I can only answer that for myself. And I have to check the answer every now and then. I have to keep going back and check that answer. But only you can ask that question of yourself and answer that for yourself. What do you live for? And if you want to ask yourself that question honestly, remember this Arabic expression. The Arabs have a saying. مَنْ أَحَبَّ شَيْئًا ذَكَرَهُمْ كَثِيرًا Whoever loves something, they remember it a lot. They think about it a lot. Whatever you live for is what you think about all the time. Maybe it's work. You're always thinking about work. Maybe it's business. Always thinking about business. Maybe it's your, your college. Always thinking about college. Where are you going to graduate? Maybe it's that girl you want to marry. Always thinking about her. Can't get your mind off her. That happens too, right? That happens too. Maybe it's your kids. Always thinking about your kids. Maybe your kids got married and you're thinking you're, you're a mother-in-law and you're always thinking about how much you hate his wife. <laughs> right? And how she took your son away. And how she's raising her, you know, your grandchildren in a way you don't like. You know? That happens too. Sometimes people just get obsessed with something and that's all they live for. And they kill themselves that way. We will find real peace when we take on, we become a small part of the mission of Allah's Messenger. <laughs> and we teach our children, our families to become part of that mission. And then we recite the Quran, which is there to help us along that mission. That's what it's supposed to do. Then everything in life will become sweet. Last bit. I share in these 10 minutes, the last part of the 10 minutes. You know Allah complains in the Qur'an, he, he destroyed many nations, right? And He made a complaint in the Qur'an, in Surah Yunus. How come not a single nation that I sent the messenger to listen to the messenger? Except the nation of Yunus, he makes the exception of Yunus, right? But He makes a complaint in the Qur'an. How come not a single one listened to the messenger? And if they only listened to the messenger, I would have we would have provided them we would, basically, I'll translate it properly we would have hooked them up <laughs> we would have hooked them up they would have lived it up in this world they would have had everything if they just listened to me because then please listen to this the world would be in their hands not in their hearts for a lot of people the world is in here even if it's not in here we're supposed to be people who get in our hands has no place in our hearts. Our hearts have a bigger problem, a bigger concern, a bigger agenda, a bigger mission. May Allah make us a people of that bigger mission. Ya Rabbana, nawwir qulubana bi nur al-Qur'an. Our Master, make our hearts full of light with the light of the Qur'an. May Allah Azza wa instill a love, atzib bi qulubina hub al-Qur'an, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Enter into our hearts a love of the Book of Allah, a love of the Qur'an. And make it for us a leader and a guide and a light and a source of mercy. Allah says, Our heart penetrating advice has come to you from Allah. Quran should go inside your heart where the disease is. The medicine should go where the disease is, right? So it should go inside. And once it goes inside, when the medicine goes inside where the disease is, what does it do? It cures. And it cures what is inside the chest. 
You know, where you and I are heart patients. And the Quran goes in and it starts curing. And when it starts curing, now Allah says, now you can follow my guidance. Wa And it's a, it's a means by which you can follow a path, a guidance. Now you start following Allah's guidance once the disease has been cured. Now you deserve Allah's mercy. So He says, وَرَحْمَةً لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And a mercy for those who believe. The ayah began with people. Ya أَيُّهَا nas. People, counsel has come to you that goes inside the heart and cures. And it ended with, it's a mercy for believers. You know what that means? The invitation is for all, but the mercy will only be for those who accept it and actually believe. Allahumma ja'alna min al-mu'mineen. Allahumma ja'alna min al-mu'mineen. May Allah make us from those who truly believe. I really, really enjoy coming here. I know it's really, really hot in here. But, um, again, I won't quote the ayah, but you can think of it. Uh, <laughs> On your own. I wish we had more time to spend with each other also. Um, I do ask you to make dua, especially for my family, my, my parents, my children, all six of them. Alhamdulillah. Yes, I have six. Four, uh, uh, four daughters and two sons. Alhamdulillah. Um, and I make dua for my wife. She's a trooper. You know, because if, if she, I, Allah knows, I can do anything. I can do anything. I can talk to this crowd. I can't control six kids. But not for 10 minutes, I, I die. So, so, you know, make dua for her. Um, if, you, if you take anything back from this session today, inshallah ta'ala, start with yourself and start with your family. And start by being the best you can be to them. And inshallah, everything, the bigger things I talked about today, they will start coming into place. Whoa. That's, that means I should stop, right? That's what that means. Thank you so much for listening carefully and being patient with me. Subhanakallah wa alhamdulillah. Okay, don't get up. Oh, hey, 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 hey.